Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you're doing well. Uh, so today we are continuing this series of uh, preparation for missionary work. And we are going to study today about the spiritual preparation for witnessing. So we had uh, uh, one part with Brother Marianne, and now we're going to continue with the spiritual preparation. Now, our key text that we found in Isaiah 6 verse 8 says, Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. So this is, um, if you remember when Isaiah felt really unworthy and, and, and not capable to be God's mouthpiece, um, the Lord, you know, asked the question, who, who will actually go? Who will actually share the gospel? Who will actually um, talk for us? And um, Isaiah could not, you know, uh, push that onto someone else. He said, you know, I'm not, I, I, I'm not able, but you know what? I will go. I'll do it. Now, this is very important. Our willingness to go despite uh, our preparation. You know, whether we prepared or not, we have to go and tell the people. Now, I want to tell you a story, a little story, a, a true story um, that was told of um, um, a, a slave in, um, back in the United States when you know, slavery was, um, was still out there. Um, this is a true story that we find um, in, in the book uh, called Early Conversion. And um, I want to read that uh, story for you, and then we'll talk about it. It says, there was held Hall, in Hartford some years ago, a convention of the Colored Baptist Association of New England. I was invited to address one of the sessions. To show what those converted in early lives are sometimes enabled to endure by God's grace, I related the following story. What's that, Willie? That's a spelling book, Jack. What's the spelling book for? To learn how to read. How you do it? We learn those things first. And so Jack learned A, B, C, etc. Mastered the spelling book and then learned to read a little, though the law forbade any colored person to do it. So as you see, Jack learned, uh, even though he was, he was forbidden to do it. And so um, now this, this spelling here, um, I can tell, you know, it shows you that uh, this, these were not very educated people because it was forbidden for any colored person to be educated. You know, maintaining ignorance is one way to control people. So it's, it's um, uh, very important to, to, to give knowledge to everyone. Now it continues. It says, one day Willie brought home a little black book. Jack asked, what's that, Willie? That's, that is a New Testament that tells about Jesus. And ere long, Jack learned to read the New Testament. And when he read that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. And that he really loved us and died for us. And that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. His heart went out in love to Jesus. He believed in him. His sins were forgiven, his heart was changed, and he became a happy Christian. Now, though a mere child, he at once began to tell others of Jesus' love. When he began a young man, he was still at work for the Lord. He used to go to the neighboring plantations, read his Bible, and explain it to the people. One day, the master said to him, Jack, I'm told that you go off preaching every Sunday. Yes, Master, I must tell, Jesus, tell sinners how Jesus died on the cross for them. Jack, if you go off preaching on Sunday, I'll tell you what I will do on Monday. What will you do on Monday, Master? I'll tie you to that tree, take the whip, and flog all this religion out of you. Now, Jack knew that his master was a determined man, but when he thought of Christ's sufferings for us and heard his Lord saying unto him, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life, he resolved to continue his work for the Lord the next Sunday. With his New Testament in the hand, he went down to the plantation and told them that his master might whip him half to death the next day. But if he did, he would not suffer more than Christ had suffered for us. The next morning, 
his master said, Jack, I hear you were preaching against yesterday. Yes, master. I must go and tell sinners how Jesus was whipped that we might go free. But Jack, I told you that if you went off preaching Sunday, I should whip you on Monday. And now I will do it. Blow after blow fell upon Jack's back while oath fell from the master's lips. Then he said, there, Jack, I don't believe you'll preach next Sunday. Now go down to the cotton field and go to work. When next Sunday came, Jack could not stand straight for his back was covered with sores and scars. But with his testament in his hand, he stood before the people of the plantation and said, Master whipped me most, uh, uh, most to death last Sunday. And I don't know, but, I will it, but he will kill me tomorrow. But if he does, I shall not suffer more than Jesus did when he died on the cross for us. Monday morning, the master called him and said, Jack, I hear you have been preaching again. Yes, master, I must go and tell sinners how Christ was wounded for our transgressions, how he sweat drops of blood for us in the garden and wore that cruel crown of thorns that we might wear a crown of joy when he comes. But I don't want to hear you, your preaching. Now bear your back and take the flogging I told you I should give you if you went off preaching. Fast flew the cruel lashes until Jack's back was covered with wounds and blood. Now, Jack, go down to the cotton field and go to work. I reckon you'll never want to preach again. When the next Sunday came, Jack's back was in terrible condition. But hobbling along, he found his friends in neighboring plantations and said, Master whipped me most to death last Sunday, last Monday. But if I can only get you to come to Jesus and love him, I am willing to die for your sake tomorrow. If there were scoffers there, do you not think they were led to believe that there was a reality in religion? If any were there who, would, who were inclined to think that ministers preach only when they get money for it, do you not think they changed their minds when they saw what wages Jack got? Many were in tears, and some gave themselves to that Savior for whose sake Jack was willing to die the death of a martyr. Next morning, the master called Jack and said, make bear your back again, for I told you that just as sure as you went off preaching, I would whip you till you give it up. The master raised the ugly whip, and as he looked at Jack's back, all lacerated, he could find no new place to strike and said, why do you do it, Jack? You know that as surely as you go off preaching Sunday, I'll whip you most to death the next day. No one pays you anything for it. All you get is a terrible flogging, which is taking you life from me or from you. You ask me, master, what I don't, uh, <laughs> it's hard to, to, to read, right? Um, why am I doing it? I'll tell you, master. I'm going to take those stripes and those scars, master, up to Jesus, by and by, to show him how faithful I've been because he loved you and me, Master, and bled and died on the cross for you and me, Master. The whip dropped, and that Master could not strike another blow. In a subdued tone, he said, go down in the cotton field. Do you think Jack went away cursing his Master, saying, oh, Lord, punish him for all his cruelty to me? No, no, his prayer was, Lord, forgive him for Jesus Christ's sake. About three o'clock, a messenger came down to the cotton field crying, Master's dying, Master's dying, come quick, Jack, Master's dying. In his private room, Jack found his master on the floor in agony, crying, Oh, Jack, I'm sinking down to hell. Pray for me, pray for me. I've been praying for you all the time, Master. You must pray for yourself. I don't know how to pray, Jack. I know how to swear, but I don't know how to pray. You must pray, Master. And finally, they both prayed. And God revealed Christ on the cross to him. And then there, he became a changed man. A few days after, he called Jack to him and said, Jack, here are your freedom papers. They give you your liberty. 
Go and preach the gospel wherever you will. And may the Lord's blessing go, over, go with you. While telling a story at the convention, I noticed a man, perhaps 60 years of age, with quite gray hair, who was deeply moved. When I had finished, he sprang to his feet and with a clear but tremulous voice said, I stand for Jack. Mr. Hammond had been speaking of me. He, was been, he has been trying to tell my sufferings, but he cannot describe the terrible agony I endured at the hands of my master, who, because I was determined to preach the gospel on the plantations around us, every Monday morning for three weeks called me up and laid the cruel lash upon my back with his own hands until my back was like raw beef. But God helped me to pray for him until he was forgiven and saved through Christ. And thank God, Jack still lives. Now I have given you only a few of his burning words, but I can tell you there are many eyes filled with tears during this touching scene, which will not soon be forgotten by those who witnessed it. Now this is a wonderful story and, and um, a true story of how witnessing for Christ um, meant for Jack. And he was willing to die, not only willing to die for the people that he was witnessing to, but he was willing to die for his master, for him to be saved, even though he was cruel to him. Now, you know, I, I don't think any of us had had to go through these, this punishment for the love of people around us. What makes a person go through this for Christ? Some people might, you know, might, might want to do it by out of duty or, or, you know, tradition. But the only thing that would last, eventually when your faith is tested, why would you do it? Why would you do it for someone else you don't know that is cruel, so cruel to you? What makes one go through this for Christ? If we read in 1 John 4 verse 19, it says, we love him because he first loved us. Now, that's the preparation we need to understand. This is what we need to get in order to, in, in, we need to understand in order to work for Christ. That's spiritual preparation. We'll go into details of what it means. But without love, we're nothing. As it says, you know, we're, without love, without, you know, charity, we're like sounding brass. We make, we have nice words, but we're nothing without love. Now, as, as some of you may know, um, uh, when I, I was a missionary school student um, in, in Germany and um, I was in the school and, and, and some, some brethren um, um, saw and, and, and invited me to, to work, do um, um, three months of practical work. And so they invited me to come to Canada for that work. Now, I, I never thought I would come to Canada and, and live there for, um, uh, after that. But anyways, I, I came to Quebec City, um, first in Montreal, and then I, I accompanied Brother Ian. Um, some of you, of you rem uh, remember him. And so I accompanied Brother Ian to, um, to visiting and, and, and Bible studies. And then eventually we opened the work in, in Quebec City. Um, I was going there um, uh, with Brother Nicholas, and um, and we were giving pamphlets. Brother Nicholas was working during the week. I was I was staying the whole, whole week by myself in a small apartment there. Um, I was around. I think I was I was I was about nineteen, maybe twenty, early twenty. Um, and so the whole week I was giving pamphlets, inviting people for cooking classes, and 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 and. Um, um, uh, spiritual conferences and, and, and coming to church on Sabbath, Bible studies. And, um, and we had quite a, you know, good, you know, people were coming. And so on Sabbath, we had our services and then again during the week. And then one day we went to, um, we were together on Sunday. We went to, to um, the university and there at the university, there were a lot of students, actually it was probably not on Sunday because, you know, schools are closed, but it was, it was probably during the week. I don't remember exactly all the details, but the point is that we were at the universities, at the university um, in Quebec City. And we're meeting um, students. 
And um, so it was right there here, you see a map of, of Quebec City. And, and I was by the university at a large boulevard. So there were cars passing by on one side. And on the other side, there were a lot of students, you know, waiting at the stop sign or waiting at the, at the light to cross. And so we're giving a lot of pamphlets and, and talking with people. And, and, and a lot of them were actually stopping. And, you know, young people, they're curious. They want to talk about things. And so um, sometimes we talk about God, but we talk about health. We talk about a lot of things about science and, and asking them questions. Until one point, I have to say, before I continue with that story, is that I was I went to missionary school, but I never meant to be a missionary. I want to be trained and I want to know more about the gospel. Um, but I was not really convinced that my my calling was to be a missionary. Um, I, I didn't have any, you know, any um, uh, plans to do that. But maybe not so much of you know, not so many of you know that the, the real reason why I decided to work for the Lord is that very day when I was in Quebec City. You know, I was standing and giving a lot of pamphlets. There were lots of people. And, 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 and Brother Nicholas and myself were giving to everyone and we could kind of cover all the people walking by. And so I was so happy that a lot of people could hear the gospel and could, could you know, could, could find the, the truth. Until I looked at the street. And on the street, there were cars passing by. Lots of cars and cars driving. Looked at those cars driving by. Nothing similar to this. And you know what I felt? I felt so discouraged. I said, you know what? In a couple of weeks, I'll go back home. And who will tell these people about the truth? Who will warn those people before they die before it's too late they're driving by they're passing by i will never see them again i'll never be there standing by this side of the road i will never see that very car that passed by who will give them the gospel who will tell them about the love of jesus and about the judgment and about the preparation they need to have before it's too late and that very day i felt a calling from the lord the lord told me Tell that person in the car. Tell them about me. You know this red car that just passed? I'll never see it again. This is one chance in a lifetime. You have to tell these people. That's when I heard the voice of God. That's when I heard the voice of God telling me, Who? Who will go? Who? will be able to give the good news of the gospel to those people. And then there, I said, you know, Lord, I will go. I'll be the one. And that stuck to my head ever since. I don't remember the day. I don't remember the exact time. But that's when I heard the voice of God. I said, you know, Lord, I will go. Now, what it is, what is it to be a missionary? Here I have some pictures of several missionaries that are sent um, to different places around the world. Now, some of you might recognize, uh, you know, with their clothes, you might recognize that these are, um, you know, members of the Latter-day Saints Church. You know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, in other words, the Mormons, right? Um, they're known um, under this name. So, you know, all these pictures are showing missionaries that are sent um, by the Mormon church. And they are young people. They are, you know, um, between, you know, 18 and, and, and 23 usually. And they're sent to so many parts of the world, places where they've never been, in parts of the world where they don't know the language, where they have no idea of the culture and, and how to reach people. 
And, um, you know, even though they don't have the truth, I think they got it right. Let's listen a little bit to what they do and, and, and what kind of preparation they have to go and give the gospel to those people. I want you to, you know, be open-minded today. I know we don't believe as they do, but the method they have is such an excellent method. I want you to get inspired by it. Let's look a little bit. So every year, approximately 53,000 more missionaries go out into the world to win as many as 250,000 converts to their faith. Every year. It means approximately, you know, four, approximately four or five uh, person they convert per year. How many people did you convert last year? Or, you know, maybe it was COVID. You know? What about the past five years? How many people did you bring to the faith? Did you bring to the church? How many people came to visit the church? Not, not let alone being converted and baptized, but just how many people came to visit the church because of your work? About four or five here for every missionary that goes out. Now, they always go two by two. So multiply that by two, right? Ten people come every year because of these two men or women that go in the street and talk with people and knock at their doors. Now, one thing that I, I had no idea of, it says that missionaries are expected to cover all expenses of their mission. Nobody pays for them. Their parents will not pay for it. It's the missionaries themselves that are expected to cover all expenses of their mission. So they work, they earn a living before going into a mission. Now, the mission time um, lasts about uh, two years for men and um, um, a little bit less for women, but about two years for men, and they're not able to work during that time. So they have to cover all expenses with the work they have done before. Um, you know, saving from their childhood money to everything they, they, they've had, they sell stuff. They, they have a very, um, um, you know, uh, rigorous savings plan to make sure they have all expenses. The rigorous training can last up to three months of 16-hour days. Now, talk about intensive, right? Um, three months of training of 16 hours. That's double, you know, what a normal hour 14 is. Every aspect of their behavior and appearance is scrutinized. They're taught how to listen, to smile, to find common ground with a stranger on the street, and to answer difficult questions or deal with hecklers. So they, they're trained, not so much in you know, the faith, because they've had that training from a child. They know the faith. They're trained into how to talk to people, how to help people. The location where missionaries serve is entirely determined by the church. They can't pick and choose. They can't go to a place where it's convenient, a rich country, uh, where people will be you know, clean and streets will be nice to walk in and, and where they know the language. No, nope, no, nope, they have no choice in that. So they're set. Now, the mission itself involves long work days, six days per week, a typical day involves two hours of scriptural study and eight to nine hours of going door to door, teaching and contacting pot potential converts. One day a week is set aside for personal activities like laundry, letter writing, or sightseeing in the host country. Right? So eight to nine hours. Now, you know, we did um, canvassing projects um, three or four years ago. And how many hours? A day was it, right? And, and uh, of course, I'm, I'm not saying we should necessarily go to that extreme, but but they're serious. You know, nobody is watching them. Nobody is supervising. They are just let you know, let go, and they have to figure it out. Eight to nine hours every day of going door to door. Now, most doors don't open that easily. Most people don't want to talk. 
as soon as they see people in a suit and tie or white shirt and tie, they know they're Mormons. A lot of people know that already. They don't want to talk. They're prejudiced. Now it says, while on their mission, missionaries can call home only on Christmas and Mother's Day, twice a year. They must be with their missionary companion 24 hours a day. They cannot come within arm's length of the opposite sex. They cannot watch television or films. And they're only allowed to listen to music and read books that are of a religious nature. And at the end of their mission, they will return to their communities, often to a banquet where they can discuss their experiences with family and friends. Wow. This is deep commitment for two years. Now, do you think they, they waste their time? Do you think they, you know, they, they, they say, oh, well, you know, I have to go to college, you know, I, or to university, or I've got to work, I have a career to, to, to set up, or, you know, money is important to me. No, they sacrifice two years of their lives. And all of them, all of them make it, except for sickness or something like that, but no, all, of them, all of them make it. And when they come home, they discuss their experiences, it's life transforming. You're never the same person any, anymore. This is why missionary work is so important. Learning so many things, how to share your faith, how to be strong in your faith, a pillar in church. And now I'm not only talking about young people. You know, in the Mormon church, most mostly it's, you know, the young people that go. And their church is growing. And not just because of their children they're making, because yes, they're making a lot of children, but it's not, it's not because of that. The church is growing nuts from the inside. Church is growing from the outside. Brethren, don't we have a lesson to learn from there? This is important to me. They have, they have a transforming experience. And when they come back to their homes, they're able to be strong pillars, motivational leaders for the churches around. So what are the uh, steps we need to take to be such missionaries as well. You know, we don't necessarily have to go to a different country or different part of the country to be missionaries. I wish some of us could go to, you know, Alberta, Saskatchewan, other places, you know, that have not been explored by the reform movement where we don't have a church there yet. So I wish some of us could do that, but we don't necessarily have to do this. But how, how can we be prepared to, have to go and, and give up our life and sacrifice. What we said first is the love, love for others. If we don't have the love, there is nothing we can do. We will do feel good work, right? We'll give a few pamphlets just so that our conscience is happy with us. This is not missionary work. So what are the steps? I, I found 10 steps to prepare us spiritually for the work we have to do. So the first one is praying all missionary work begins with prayer so before you go prayer softens the heart of people and also helps us to be sensitive to god's guidance as he directs us to those who need to hear the good news you know we need to be driven and the way we're driven is by god you have to have a direct communication with jesus if you don't pray in the morning, during your, your private time, you know, your time where you have, it, it's very precious. If you don't pray, you will not be prepared to be missionary. So this is the first step. In Ephesians 6, it says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So why is it that, you know, Apostle Paul says to the Ephesians, why is it that we have to pray always? So that we may be bold, 
so that we may explain the gospel with, you know, uh, and, and all the mysteries of the gospel um, with boldness, courage. This is hard. Brethren, being a true missionary is a very lonely work. And the rewards are very scarce. Very few people will accept you. But you know what? They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting gospel. And our role is not to make them accept it. Our goal is to be ambassadors, to plant. Plant the truth. Represent your Lord. And then people will either accept or reject. That's up to them. You have been doing your, the work. So now, once you've been praying, and this is, I think, the first step, and maybe some of us are missing that point. And we're, if we're going out and we want to share things, but we have not uh, uh, held a communication tight with God, we're not able to, to share well. So the second point is start reading. Start reading the Bible for yourself. Um, get in the word. If you don't already have a consistent time during the day when you meet with God, commit yourself now to daily Bible study and prayer. Daily. A time, a private time between you and God. Um, consistently. Where you read. I'm not talking about, you know, morning and evening worship with your family. I'm thinking your private time where you study, where you pray, where you ask the Lord to lead you. This is a preparation you need to do. Now, we talk about spiritual preparation. This is very practical too. It's a spiritual and practical application. So how can we know that we have the truth if we don't study? Can you prove to someone that you meet on the street that what you believe is right. I mean, I know that we've studied the same topics over and over, but when you actually meet somebody that has a very different faith from you, you know, they can be Christians, but not Adventists. Um, they might believe in the immortality of the soul. They might believe in, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, the Virgin Mary. Um, they may believe in, in all kinds of things. They might not be Christians. How can you prove to them that what you believe is right? Do you know? Are you sure that what you believe is right? So how can you prove it? And that is when you need to learn the Bible. Read it for yourself. Now, the third step is to imitate Christ. And this is far, brethren, this is far from what we are doing. Imitating Christ is not just coming to church and, and, and doing a few things. Becoming like Christ, being conformed to his mind, faith, and action will not happen in five minutes. It's not just, you know, oh, today I'm going to do missionary work, so I'm going to represent Christ. So let me make up my mind, and I'm going to be Christ-like now. No. If you're not... If you're not like Christ in your daily routine, in your, you know, work, school, wherever you are during the week, in your family, in your home, in your private life, it will not happen in five minutes. It takes time, discipline, and your willingness to allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart and shape you into the image of Christ. So discipline and time. Learn to be like Christ. You know, talking about the um, uh, Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and all the, you know, the people that are active missionaries that have not the truth. They don't have the truth, but yet they go and they share what they know. And you know, they are successful in what they do. And we that have the truth, maybe are not believing it strong enough because we're not willing to go. The fourth step is to depend on Christ. Because again, you will be rejected so many times. Life on the mission field or in the street or wherever you go, you know, it could be in a different country, could be in a different place, could be in your own home with your, you know, members of the family that are not necessarily converted. 
Life on the mission field is physically, spiritually, and emotionally demanding. His strength is sufficient to meet every need you have, however deep, however immediate. And I have had that experience, going canvassing and being tired. You know, physically tired, but especially emotionally tired. Because you've seen so many doors slap back at you, people, you know, being angry, people being, you know, rejecting you. Um, I've had people threaten me. Um, it's, it's hard. You know, you have good intentions. And every door, you know, the previous door you've been rejected, but now you're in front of a new door and you can't let them see that you've been rejected just before. You have to smile again, be excited again. And after a while, I was, I was disappointed. You know, I, I said, you know what? It's not working. I'm, I'm trying and people reject me. And, you know, and I said, you know what? There are a few more doors in that street and I'll do those three doors and three houses. And then, then I'm done. I just, you know, that's it. That's it for the day. I, I just, Maybe I'll sleep over it and tomorrow I'll have more energy, but today I'm, I'm, I'm done. So I knocked those three doors, three rejections. And I said, all right, I, I turned around. And then something told me, you know what? Don't, don't just come back to the street, on, on the street without doing anything. Just cross over and, do, and come back knocking at those doors on the other side. And I was really disappointed. I didn't want to do it. And the voice was insistent. And so I crossed over and I knocked. And that first door was an old lady. She was sick and she took some time to open her door, but I could hear there was some noise in the house. So I waited and she opened the door and she said she was so sick and nobody was visiting her. Nobody would come to inquire about our health. Nobody would ever, you know, care about her. And I said, you know what? I care for you. That's why I came here. I was disappointed. And I told her my story. I was disappointed. I wanted to go. And the Lord told me to knock at your door. And I cared. And I wanted to knock. And we talked for about an hour. We prayed together. And that lady, it was such a nice experience. You know, it Gain all the courage that I was about to lose, it came back to me. The Lord wanted me to have that experience because no matter what, the Lord leads. He knows who needs to hear the gospel and when. You know, we have to depend on him. He is the one that shows us the way. He is the one that encourages us when we're tired, when we're, we don't want to go anymore, when we're bored, when we are alone. You know how hard it is? Many people don't, don't realize that. But during the week, yes, we do some Bible studies. Um, yes, we visit some people from the church and people we know. But we also do missionary work, giving pamphlets in the metro here in Montreal or in the street, knocking at doors. And it's, very, it's a very lonely work. And even if you're accompanied by someone, um, it is still hard. It is still hard. But when the Lord is here for us, then uh, we have strength. I, I want to give you, you know, courage. In Zechariah 4, verse 6, it says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by my might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. When we go with the Spirit of God, wonderful things can happen. You know, you don't have, you don't need, <sighs> brethren, you don't need any preparation other than going with the Lord. You don't need to know all the answers to all the questions. You don't need to be familiar with the Bible and being able to speak it so well, you know, with nice words and, 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 and you know, beautiful sermons. no. You just need to have the spirit with you to have Jesus by your side. And then you can go. Anyone can go. Matter of fact, the children 
actually are much more efficient than adults sometimes because they're so innocent. They tell the people as they see it. They don't use choice, you know, choice chosen words. They don't use, you know, they're they're very comfortable with saying things as they think it is. And so when we go with the Lord, the Lord encourages us. He takes care. Your work is to go and share. Now, point number five, be uncomfortable. (laughs) Be ready for that. Get out of your comfort zone. Serve the poor. Feed the hungry. Build things with your hands. Learn to do new things that don't come natural to you. Here it says, most of your time on the mission field or in the street will be spent in unfamiliar situations. Get used to it. Learn to be comfortable as an adult learner. Learn to fail uh, gracefully. Learn to depend on others and rely on Christ. (laughs) That's beautiful, right? This is, it is not natural for me to go and knock at the door of an unknown person. And I feel like I'm bothering them, right? They might be busy. They might be on the phone. They might be doing something with their kids. And, you know, naturally we feel uncomfortable. But we have to overcome that. Uh, that that tendency, that feeling, and be bold and proclaim the gospel. Now, back in in when the uh, apostles were doing missionary work, people would gather around them in the you know the town center. They would start speaking, and people would come from everywhere. Today, it's not happening. Today, we have to go into the homes. We can use different. We can use different methods. We can use the internet. We can use you know TV stations. We can use different things, but Nothing beats going door to door. Nothing beats it. And I want you to remember that because most, most of the new converts of the Mormon church or the Jehovah Witnesses, they reached door to door. That works. It is something that has been proven. Now, of course, if you have connections and friends and people that you know already at work or at school, that, that's, that's great too. You can witness to them but nothing beats going door to door. Now, point number six, don't be perfect, but give your all. Because no one is perfect. But learn that Jesus gave everything. You don't have to be perfect, but you need to give all and remember who sent you. And God will perfect the imperfect works of your hand. So (laughs) people will say, well, I don't know what to say. I'm at the door, I knock, and then what? Well, You can have a very basic preparation, but you don't need to learn something by heart. You don't need to to be perfect to give the gospel. You know, the Mormons have a faith that is really, really hard, really complicated. It is strange. It's a strange faith. So, So do we. You know, our faith is complicated. People don't, you know, accept it readily. And... We don't have to perfectly explain everything right then at the door. But we have to make uh, uh, our best. We have to do our best and give our best. And when we do that, God does the rest. Look at this. In 1 Peter 5 verse 10, it says, But the God of all grace, who has called us into his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered it a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. How does God make us perfect? After that, we have suffered a while. Brethren, going door to door is uncomfortable. I'm telling you, it's suffering. We suffer because we're not, we're not used to it. And as you suffer and you learn, then eventually you're good at it. it bec- you become good at it. You're established, you're strengthened, you're settled. You know and you become comfortable in doing the things that were uncomfortable per- before. You cannot be made perfect by a miracle. God will first ask you to suffer. God will first ask you to make that step out of your comfort zone, and then that will make you perfect. So, brother, I, I really want to encourage you. I know some of you have a lot of things to do. You think about so many things. 
you have different goals, but please take the time to suffer a little bit for Christ. Think about the Pentecost. What, did, what experience did the disciples have at the Pentecost? In Acts of the Apostles, page 37 says, the disciples prayed with intense earnestness for a fitness to meet men and in their daily intercourse to speak words that would lead sinners to Christ. Putting away all differences, all desire for the supremacy, they came close together in Christian fellowship. They drew nearer and nearer to God. And as they did this, they realized what a privilege had been theirs in being permitted to associate so closely with Christ. Sadness filled their hearts as they thought of how many times they had grieved him by their slowness of comprehension, their failure to understand the lessons that for their good, he was trying to teach them. So it is for our good, brethren. Sometimes we go to the streets and we fail. But what does that failure mean to you? How do you learn from that? You know, we have to be ready to lead sinners to Christ. Not reject them, but lead them to Christ. Lead them to repentance. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not telling them what's wrong. No, no. We have to tell sinners that what they're doing is wrong. But we have to bring them to Christ as we do that. And not push them away. Right? You don't go out and tell people that what they're doing is wrong. You tell them what is the best. And then you lead them to love the better way. It continues. The text says, these days of preparation were days of deep heart searching. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for the holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving. They did not ask for a blessing for themselves merely. They were weighted with the burden of the salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel was to be carried to the world and they claimed the power that Christ has promised. <laughs> what a wonderful promise. Christ is powerful. Do you believe it? Do you believe he can use you to witness to people? You know, all this eastern part of Canada has not been evangelized yet. <laughs> it's, it's not even a, a drop in the ocean. It's half a drop in the ocean that we've done. We need to be active missionaries. We need to have that culture as a church to go out and reach to the people. We need to think, you know, parents, starting from the parents, parents need to think, I want to be an active missionary. And when our children will see that, they will want to be like us. You know, they, they, if, if we sleep in church, our kids will do the same. How do we expect the younger generation to do better than we did? It is up to us. We are the model for the generation after us. And if we are not active, how do you think our children will be active? They won't be. Point number eight, it's exercise. Because evangelism is like a muscle. The more you use it, the stronger it gets. So we have to learn to share our faith. We have to become accustomed to articulating the gospel and telling how Christ changed our life. Have you shared with people how God changed your life? How he was able to you know, make you whole? How he was able to make you happy and save you from so many dangers and, and problems of this world? You know, you have to uh, uh, make sure you exercise these abilities. You have to uh, hone your skills. You have to share to people. And the first person you talk to, that person may, may laugh at you. But the more you do it, the better you will be at it. And point number nine, serve others. Develop a spirit of service. Gain the experience of putting the well-being of others in front of your own joy. Volunteer at your church or in your community, or simply step forward and help others in your day to, in, in your day-to-day -day life. Learn to say, serve others so Jesus receive the glory, not yourself. Service is at the heart of almost every missionary's daily experience. I, have, I, I see that all the time. Um, I can tell you, you know, many times I've been visiting people, especially I remember one family 
um, I was visiting them in the, in the south of France and um, I would, I would go there because it was about eight hours away from my house. I would tour about every two months. And, um, and I, I had Bible studies planned for that day, you know? And so I visited them. And when I arrived at their place, the lady was exhausted. She was a young lady. She was maybe 25, 26. Um, I was a little bit younger than her. And, um, and she had already four kids. She was exhausted. She could not do it. Her kids were crying. Her house was a mess. And she was exhausted. And I remember there, I sat down and I said, you know what? I can't. I can just ask you to listen and, 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 and have a Bible study right there on your kitchen table when the whole house is a mess. And I said, how can I help you? And I realized that what she needed the most was not a Bible study today. She needed the most was help. And I went on and I cleaned the whole kitchen. And when I say cleaning, I just didn't, I, I didn't just do the dishes. I cleaned everywhere, everywhere, the floor, the, the, the baseboards, everything was sticky and dirty. Not because they were dirty people, just because she didn't have time. She was exhausted. And so that day I spent three hours there cleaning everything and we prayed and I left. And last week I talked to her on, on Messenger and she still remembers that day. And after that, I came many times, you know, we had Bible studies and everything and Eventually, I left for Canada, and, but she's still an independent Adventist, you know, um, but she remembers that day, and we have that relationship today, and so service is of utmost importance without asking anything in return. I could not write in my work reports, you know, three hours of cleaning. That's not what my job description is, but... This is what we need to do. And the final, final point I want to have for today is to have a personal testimony. Some testimonies are gained on the feet, bearing them, as well as on the knees, praying for them. This is where you can get a personal testimony. Brother, I want you to have that testimony. I want you to be able to share with people what you have done. Share, you know, as you go and, and win souls for Christ, you can tell others about how these first souls were won for Christ. And these in turn will go and, and, and let others know uh, uh, who it, Jesus is to them. In John 7, verses 17 to 18, it says, And if any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. So we need to seek the glory of God. Tell the experience of what God did to you, how he pushed you to be a better person, to be a missionary. Where were you convinced? When did you have the desire to go out for Christ? You know, we need to have that culture swift, uh, 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 um, shift in our church. A complete shift of thinking that we're here to witness and not just to be a social club. We need to have that culture as the Mormons uh, did, as the Jehovah Witnesses did. You know, especially the Mormons. The Mormons were not witnessing so much um, until the 60s. 1960s before that they were just you know growing out of you know like most other churches and spreading and you know talking to people around them but they were not active missionaries until the 60s and one man one of their um, leaders um, developed a plan a detailed plan for everyone to be involved there were missionary schools established everywhere People were excited to send their kids to missionary schools. People were excited to have an experience in another place, a place that was adventurous, a place that was the unknown. Brethren, my experience in missionary school is what made them who I am, is what made me who I am. 
I am a different person after having spent two years in mission school. And I wish that for every youth. And also as an adult, you know, I, I want you to be active missionary and you will see that this will change your life. Don't run after things that are only for this earth. Run after things that will give you a crown of glory. So now we'll have um, some time for questions and um, um, maybe some testimonies uh, of what, how you were brought to the gospel and, um, and who came to get you. Um, so uh, we're going to go into the time of uh, questions at this time. Thank you so much.